Michael, welcome to Mind Body Solution. I labeled this podcast a quest to conquer the mind body problem. Now, with that being said, tell me, Michael, what is consciousness? Well, the difficulty with that question is that the word itself means different things to different people, right? So um, to some people, when they hear the word consciousness, they think all the stuff in my mind at the moment, all the thoughts and memories and perceptions, emotions, that's me, that's my consciousness. Um, but that's not actually what that word means to most people who study the topic, most philosophers, scholars, psychologists, neuroscientists. Uh, one, one way that I like to put it is, think of a bucket, think of your mind like a bucket, right? And you can think of all the things that got put in the bucket, like, as I just said, memories and perceptions and emotions and so on. Those are the things in the bucket. The question of consciousness is, what is the bucket? Yeah. Not what's in it, <laughs> but what is the bucket made out of? What does it mean to have this mind thing that can contain contents, that can have experience, subjective experience? So we have to start with that that the word itself, as I use it, as many people who study consciousness use it, is focused on this question of not the content of the mind, but what does it mean? How, how do you have a subjective conscious experience of anything at all, right? In your book, so I'd just like to show everyone your book. It's called Rethinking Consciousness, A Scientific Theory of Subjective Experience. To anyone listening, that is the title of the book. I was just holding it in my hand. And I've read this book three times. I read it once when it first came out. I read it the second time when I was writing my own essay on consciousness. And Michael was actually one of the people to assist me with writing this essay, which I am very grateful for. So thank you, Michael, for that. And the third time was to prepare for this interview. In this book, you very clearly define your terms. You define attention and awareness and the difference between those two concepts. So let's briefly discuss that. Attention is another one of those concepts where the, the word has different meanings to different people. And even in science, it's taken on different uh, meanings for, for different people. But um, yes, many people colloquially think of attention as where I'm looking, but that's not really what it means. It's scientifically. So attention means the brain has focused processing resources on something. That's in a nutshell what attention is. And uh, attention has been studied most heavily with respect to certain parts of the brain, especially the cerebral cortex. Uh, but it is, for example, let's say you're reading a book. This is a good example of what attention is. Your gaze is on the book, but your attention, your mind, maybe on some sounds in your backyard behind you. Or the next moment it may shift to a thought about what happened yesterday. And then the next moment it shifts back to the book itself that you're looking at, right? That's attention. It's the, the content, it's the, it's the ability to focus resources, processing resources on a limited uh, set of signals and process them in depth so that you can respond or remember or understand those things. So attention is entirely mechanistic, and this is really crucial. It's something buildable, and many people have done that. There's oodles of uh, artificial um, computer, artificial uh, neural network systems that have attention and pay attention in the this strict mechanistic sense of the word. So that's what attention is. It's a data processing trick that the brain uses. So awareness is a, a very loosely used term, again, and often people have to define exactly what they mean by it. And there's kind of two ways that people use the word awareness. And one is sometimes called objective awareness, which basically just means the information got in, right? And so in, there's this sense in which um, uh, your microwave is objectively aware of the numbers that you typed into it because <laughs> the information got in, right? Or you look at, I don't know, an ant crawling around and then it turns and 
moves away from your foot because <laughs> it doesn't want to get stepped on. It, I mean, that's the anthropomorphized way of talking about it. But there's a sense in which you could say the ant is objectively aware of the foot, right? Because the information got in, it processed it, it did something about it. And then there's this other way that awareness is used, which is much more aligned to the concept of consciousness. And that is sometimes called subjective awareness, which means I have a subjective experience. I can say, oh, I felt that, right? Everyone knows that there's tons of stuff, the majority of stuff going on in our heads we're not aware of. So technically we're objectively aware of it, but we're not subjectively aware of it. And so subjective awareness and consciousness are sometimes used interchangeably because they both refer to this um, experience, the uh, kind of ineffable subjective experience that uh, philosophers are arguing about for centuries. It's great that you mentioned this discussion between philosophers regarding this ineffable experience, this subjective phenomenal experience of consciousness, because that's where the debate really starts. A lot of philosophers and scientists and theologians and anyone describing or discussing consciousness always brings up the phenomenal subjective experience. I mean, Thomas Nagel describes it well when he talks about the what is it like to be a bat? I mean, what is it really like to be a human being? What is it like to be me? What is it like to be Michael Graziano? I mean, there's no true way for me to ever discover what it's like to feel like you, to experience what it's like to be you. And just for all the listeners who are not familiar with philosophy, David Chalmers coined the term, the hard problem of consciousness. This this question or this debate to try and understand exactly how it's possible for people who experience subjective experiences to objectify what is inherently something that only you have access to. So I'm the only one who has access to my own consciousness. I'm the only one who has true access to the consciousness I experience. And the same goes for you. So let's briefly talk about that. We, as a species, and philosophers as a subset of the species claim to have this phenomenal experience or subjective experience. And um, <clears throat> so what does that claim rest on? Everything that you claim to be true about yourself, everything you think is true, no matter how firmly you believe that it's really true in the moment, derives from information in your brain. Otherwise you wouldn't be able to think the thought, right? So ultimately when we're all arguing over what is consciousness, uh, what is this ineffable experience inside of us? The question really boils down to what is the information in the brain that leads us to that self image? Right. We have a self image an attribution that we see yeah. giving ourselves. Right. Right. And we're absolutely certain it's true, but that certainty is itself based on information constructed in the brain. Right. So the brain constructs a self description, and that self description uh, leads us to believe things about ourselves and make claims about ourselves, including, oh, I have a subjective feeling. Oh, I have this uh, experience. Oh, I have this ineffable. Um, consciousness property. All of this flows from information the brain constructs that in some ways is part of a self-model, a self-description. So once put that way, and that, that I think is logically necessary. There's no way around that logic, right? Uh, because uh, everything, everything we think we know derives from information in here. And that just th logically must be true. But once you put it that way, you are forced into the evolutionary framework because the brain doesn't just construct information for the heck of it, right? That's expensive. There's networks that have to evolve to be good at that kind of information. And then they have to process it and use energy to process it and so on. So why? That starts you getting onto the evolutionary question. Where does this stuff evolve from? What's the survival advantage of having that kind of self-description built in the brain. I think that any theory of consciousness that does not take into account the evolutionary basis of how this 
sort of schema or model or whatever theory you have comes to be from an evolutionary perspective. If you are not taking evolution into account, natural selection, then you have an incomplete theory of consciousness. And you do this perfectly. You start by giving us a very brief history into the nature of how attention evolved or how these attention schemas which result in awareness and consciousness have evolved over time. And you paint a beautiful picture. So take us through some of that. So in my book, I start from the beginning of neurons, really, uh, which is a very long time ago, maybe 700 million years ago, somewhere in that time frame. Nobody's 100% sure. Uh, but we know that neurons exist in jellyfish and in all kinds of other animals. And the last common ancestor between us and jellyfish was probably 700 or so million years ago. So it's a very long time ago that neurons evolve. Um, but when you develop complex networks of neurons, not even brains yet, but things that process information, you run into a, a, a problem right away that the system must solve, which is the uh, excess amount of information flowing in. Right? You have to have some way of limiting it and saying, I'm going to respond to that and not this, that, this, and that. I'm going to uh, heighten my processing of this one thing, and I'm going to press down and suppress my processing of these other things. And so something has to do that. And that something is the mechanism of attention. And attention evolves very slowly from very simple uh, initial properties uh, and so really simple versions of attention can be found all over the animal kingdom. And one of the examples I talk about is the crab eye, which was one of the first to be really understood in neuroscience. Uh, light enters the crab's eye. The crab eye has all these little facets, right? But they, um, they don't give a veridical account of the visual world. They talk to each other and they enhance the brighter spots and, and uh, suppress the darker spots and produce this enhanced image that essentially makes the crab more responsive to the uh, part with the more intense visual um, stimulation. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an attention mechanism that says, focus on that, ignore this. But it's a very simple mechanism. It's just it's a mind, mindlessly little simple wiring diagram. And yet it's the first step, it's the beginning of a processor that deploys its resources carefully and focuses on one thing over another thing. And that's the beginning of this whole process. What I do in my book is uh, trace what's known about attention mechanisms in a variety of animals and how it may have evolved. And I start with things like the crab eye that I just talked about. Uh, and I move to vertebrates uh, and vertebrates uh, have their origin a very long time ago. Uh, maybe half a billion years ago, 500 million years ago, uh, with little squishy, squiggly sea creatures with a single um, cord uh, down the center and maybe a little enlarged ganglion at one end of the brain. And, uh, and what happens is the problem of how to respond to a complex world is more than just visual information comes in, which part should I orient toward, right? It's also, I'm getting auditory information and I'm getting touch information and maybe some kind of chemical sense like smell. And all of that has to converge on some processor that says, oh, this is the part of space or this is the object that should take our focus of processing at the moment. And so it's no longer good enough as you increase in sophistication. It's no longer good enough to have separate little attention mechanisms for the eyeball or for the, the leg or something like that. You have to have a central place that can pull this information together and make this determination. What's the most important thing at the moment? And in vertebrates, that looks like uh, a structure. It seems to be a structure uh, that's called the, um, the tectum, the optic tectum. It's very old. It's dating back to uh, you know, there, there are these creatures, lampreys, which aren't quite fish, but they're sort of fish. They're little squiggly guys. They don't have jaws. They're very primitive, uh, but they're vertebrates. And they, the last common ancestor between 
fish and lampreys, actually between us and lampreys is about half a billion years ago, right? But they have this optic tectum and we do too. So it's conserved through all this time. It's very, very useful. And, and we all use it for the same reason. Uh, it, it integrates sensory information and it makes a determination what's the most important object right now. And then it sends outputs to orient toward that object. And so it's a kind of, it's the next step in attention and focusing the resources of the brain. Uh, and you see that it's a brain stem uh, structure and you see it in fish and you see it in amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals and so on. So uh, you have this enormous growth in, in sophistication. And this is a structure that as I talk about in the book is most probably most heavily studied in frogs. Uh, for some reason that became the animal of choice for the optic tectum. And it's a wonderful, interesting story. It helps them catch flies with their tongues <laughs> and things like that. This is the frog's attention. This is the highest level of thought in a frog is its optic tectum that's taking in vision and touch and sound and so on and putting it together into a single map, a sensory map. And then that sensory map has outputs to the frog's behavior. And so this is how the frog can get uh, a vast amount of data pouring in all the time and yet respond to a single event, essentially filtering out all the junk that it doesn't need to pay, attend to at the moment and focus its resources and its uh, overt behavior toward one particular thing. Uh, and so that's the, that's the heart, the sensory motor interface, the um, integrator and the attention machine. And uh, I think one of the key points about attention, many people study attention uh, in the literature, in my view, without really understanding what it is at its deepest level. Attention is the reason why anything has any intelligence at all. Because uh, if you don't have attention, if you can't focus resources on deploy them and, and um, concentrate them on one thing at a time, then your resources are spread thinly over a, a million or more, literally a million or more inputs at any one time. And you can't react intelligently. Uh, your processing resources aren't good enough to handle all that uh, data processing all at the same time. The only way you get any kind of intelligent behavior out of anything, including us people, is by taking the resources we have and focusing them uh, one at a time on this problem versus that problem and then processing it very deeply. And so attention is the basis of all intelligence. I mean, just think about an octopus. It is such an alien-like creature. It is separated from us on the evolutionary tree by such an extreme length that we have almost at this point, no relation to them. They're so alien and, and, and you can see it. You can see it from an octopus when you watch it on camera, when you watch it on TV. Um, there was recently a documentary done, an Oscar winning documentary in South Africa on an octopus, my octopus friend or my octopus teacher, I think it was called. And it's amazing to see what these things can do. These creatures are incredibly complex. They can do fascinating things. I mean, there's even this one video online where you watch an octopus pick up a coconut shell and it basically carries this coconut shell for months uh, before it dies because we know octopuses don't really live for that long. But they were wondering why the octopus was doing this. And eventually you see that one day when rocks and boulders were falling into the ocean, the octopus decides to take the coconut and put it over its head. Sure, yeah. Uh, so octopuses are wonderful. I love octopuses. They're the weirdest creatures. And, you know, some people have speculated, and I wonder if this is true, if they lived more than about seven years, you know, if they lived 50 years, would they accumulate wisdom and take over the world if we'd have, you know, an octopus run world? I don't know. They're very brilliant creatures. Uh, and, and the thing to remember about octopuses is, is you're right, they're alien. Uh, they separated from us uh, you know, more than half a billion years ago, they, they were, they're not vertebrates. I mean, they're much more closely related to a clam than they are to us, right? They're mollusks like clams are. And um, they are of all 
intelligent creatures on earth. They are the farthest from us genetically and in environment and in uh, evolutionary tree. So it's they're as good as alien. If you look at science fiction aliens from other planets, like you don't have to, because that's what octopuses are. And somehow we, we managed to always make aliens look very much like an octopus. I mean, think about a lot of the alien creatures. It's always these weird creatures with tentacle-like organs um, or tentacle-like arms. It's, it's, <laughs> octopuses actually are alien in a very strange way. True, that's true. So they're very strange creatures, though. And I think, I think I'm not alone in this. The reason why they got so intelligent is because they're predators and they're visual predators. And vision in particular requires so much processing power because there's so much information pouring in. That's where you start getting this attention kind of process where you have to winnow down and then focus on the key things and then process them deeply. So they're visual predators. And that kind of lifestyle requires this enormous brain. And, um, and they've clearly evolved that they have attention they have uh, incredible intelligence. They have cognitive capacity. They do things like solve problems and open jars and learn stuff by watching another octopus without having to even try it themselves. Uh, they're quite incredible creatures. Uh, but the, the question, one of the questions I raise in my book, many people raise, are they conscious? And the answer is nobody knows. Like there are a lot of people who want to say, yes, definitely. I see it in their eyes. And my answer to that is the fact that people are so prone to see consciousness in an octopus says a great deal about us people. <laughs> and it says absolutely nothing about the octopus. Okay, now that we've painted a picture of how these attention schemas and conscious experiences can evolve in other creatures, let's now bring this into humans. How does this play a role when it comes to a human being? In humans, so we still have these same mechanisms like the optic tectum I just talked about, uh, but we have an additional mechanism. And that's essentially, well, our cerebral cortex is a kind of giant attention machine. That's what it does. Its job is to filter vast amounts of information, window it down to what seems most important at the moment and process that in depth. That's what a cerebral cortex does. So it's a super attention mechanism. And this is something that evolved on top of the uh, simpler brainstem mechanisms. And you start to see it in reptiles. Uh, reptiles don't have a cerebral cortex, but they have a part of the brain that grows and ultimately turns into ours. Um, birds have a similar um, structure in the brain too. It's all related. We all emerged from reptiles about 250 million years ago. That was our common ancestor. Uh, and so they have a lot of the same mechanisms that we have. Um, and so we have this super attention and super attention does not mean that we are able to process everything around us. It means almost the opposite. It means we're really good at picking only a few things and processing those and being incredibly stupid about everything else that we've blocked out. And this is what people often don't realize um, in, in sort of in the colloquially or casual sense, people feel like they're seeing everything around them and they're not, they're seeing maybe a 10th of a percent of what's flowing in. And most of what's going on around them is going entirely past them uh, outside their, their uh, attention. And their attention mechanism is built to make that happen. <laughs> Otherwise they can't feel, they can't process. There's only so much uh, processing capacity in this brain. So focus it on the things that are important moment by moment. With that being said, what is attention schema theory? If you had to describe the, the actual theory in a nutshell, just for the listeners. Right, so uh, the, the kernel of it is that the brain constructs a model of attention. And by model, I mean a bundle of information that represents something. The brain constructs a model of attention. And when we claim to have consciousness, what we're doing is relying on the information in that model. So that's the kernel of it. It's very easy to state. It's very hard to really understand how to unpack it and what all the parts mean. 
So where does that come from? Uh, here's one way to get at it, and that's the social angle. There are lots of different ways to try to get at this theory, but the social angle is one way. I look at you, and let's say the literal reality is you're paying attention, your brain is attending to something, whatever it is, like, I don't know, the sandwich on the table next to you, and I see you focusing attention on the sandwich. How do I understand you? Um, it's no good for me to build a model of your attention in any detail because I can't see your neurons and attention is a, the intricate interaction of millions upon millions of neurons in your brain. That's too complex. I can't do that. I can't model the truth. So what my brain does is create a fiction, a, a caricature. And the caricature, this simple little cartoon says, oh, he has a, a, a consciousness thing. And right now he's conscious of the sandwich. His consciousness is focused on the sandwich. And that's my simple uh, cartoon way of understanding your state of attention. So that's a model of attention. And in that case, it's very useful because I can, I can predict your behavior. I can say, oh, he's attending to the sandwich. That means he does not see the, um, <clears throat> I don't know, the, the bird that's flying too close that might hit him in the back of the head. So I better warn him about that other thing over there. Or it helps me predict, oh, I think he's gonna reach for that sandwich or whatever. It's, it's useful socially, uh, but it's a, it's a simplified model that I build of your brain. Uh, and so in a sense, just take that and turn it inward. My brain can build a model of its own attention and help keep track of its own processes and help control its own attention. So, And your approach, the attention schema theory and your overall approach, I must say is very similar to some of the approaches taken by others. I mean, Carl Friston also talks about consciousness in a very similar way, but he they talk about it as inference. We're basically making these inferences about reality. Anil Set does a very similar thing with explaining consciousness. He refers to it as a sort of hallucination, a controlled hallucination. And I think it's very fascinating because the fact that we're using these simplified internal models and we have such poor and limited resources, we're always going to draw incorrect or inaccurate conclusions about reality. That's right. Every, everything we know, every single thing we think we know about anything <laughs> derives from information in there. And that information is at best finely titrated so that it's only as complete and accurate as you need in order to get by. Mm -hmm. You don't want it any more than that because it's a waste of resources. And when you think about it, we create all these models and it's already so fascinating that we're creating a model of ourselves. But what's even more fascinating is the fact that we do this for other beings too. I mean, we don't just attribute consciousness to ourselves. We don't just draw that conclusion for us. We often do this for every other species we see. We do this for our pets. We do this for other animals. We tend to do this. Some people go as far as attributing consciousness to everything. When you take panpsychism in the view that consciousness is at the very beginning and everything is conscious. I mean, a rock is conscious, a tree is conscious, anything is conscious. So this, what is known as theory of mind, it's very fascinating when you take into account this view that we're attributing consciousness to ourselves. So therefore, we must be attributing this similar type of consciousness to others, the theory of mind. Yes, that's right. Theory of mind. So theory of mind, of course, is this idea from cognitive psychology that people have a kind of innate way, automatic way of building theories of what's going on in someone else's mind. And so that's theory of mind. One of the points I've tried to make in my own research uh, is we do more than attribute specific thoughts to other people. So you look at the theory of mind literature and it's almost all about how we attribute emotions, beliefs, perceptions to someone else. In other words, the items that go in someone else's bucket Right. But the point that I often emphasize is we also attribute to the other person a bucket. 
they have a mental bucket into which those items can go. <laughs> they have a mind. And if you don't, if you can't uh, imagine that, if you can't attribute to someone else a mind that can contain stuff, then you have no social cognition at all. Uh, so theory of mind, social cognition, all depends ultimately on this much more fundamental uh, ability to attribute to someone else that they have the capacity to be aware of things, right? To ha they have that mind bucket. And because we're very social animals, because we evolved that way, we have enormous amounts of circuitry, huge amounts of real estate in our brains, especially the cerebral cortex, devoted to that particular task. A perfect example of how we attribute consciousness to other beings would be to take into account Kevin, your puppet. And this is something you often show in your lectures and a lot of your, I think one of your TED talks, you bring out Kevin, which is your puppet. And the moment you start using your ventriloquism skill, this art form, people tend to then automatically apply some sort of consciousness to this dummy. So people start to give it a personality, give it some traits. They, it develops its own character. And we can't help but do that. This is just something we have to do. So we, we're constantly attributing mind and specific contents of mind to other things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we evolved that way. I, I think of it a little bit like uh, turning up the volume knob, like evolution took the volume knob on our social attribution and turned it up and turned it up because every time it got a little higher we got a little better at reading each other's minds which made us better at interacting and cooperating which is the basis for everything us humans do so successfully uh, but one consequence of that is a spillover effect we're constantly attributing minds and mind states to everything else around us uh you know yes you're right rocks and trees and the river floods and oh my god it was the river god Mm. Or, um, you know, Ke Kevin the puppet, everyone knows intellectually that he doesn't actually have a mind, but it doesn't matter because your social networks are constructing that model anyway. Though you, you can't help it. You look at Kevin, you're like, okay. This, I think at this point, I mean, we're talking about how we perceive reality. And we know our visual cortex is a very important and predominant part of the human experience. Perception, I mean, Human beings, when it comes to perception, we know that the visual system truly does dominate our experience. Unless, of course, you are someone who is blind and therefore thereafter you will have other senses that will become heightened or more utilized by the brain. But when it comes to human beings, we know perception is very much a visual experience for most of us. But what is fascinating and what some of your research shows is that although we know the physics behind perceiving in terms of the visual system, and that photons of light are constantly entering our eye, getting, it hits our retina, our brains tend to process that information and create this phenomenal experience of whatever we're seeing. For example, if we're seeing a red flower, then that is what we see. We know the photons of light are entering the eye. But what's fascinating by some of the research you guys did was that around 5% of people still believe in extra mission. Sure, so yes, you're, you're absolutely right. There's this idea sometimes called extra mission, the idea that we see by stuff coming out of the eyes, beaming out and touching things, uh, or we um, direct our visual attention in this way somehow. And the idea of extra mission as opposed to intromission, which is the, you know, the light comes in the eye theory. Uh, these days, most people view extra mission as some kind of silly, ridiculous, old fashioned fringe thing, perhaps not realizing how recently that was the dominant view. Uh, and there are whole sectors of the world for which it's still widely believed. Uh, and many people out there in your audience may say to themselves, wait a minute, but there's gotta be some truth to that because I can feel someone stare on the back of my neck. There's some component in there, right? And the answer is no, alas, that has been studied very thoroughly. <laughs> Stuff does not come back out of the eye unless you're, you know, a nocturnal animal with a shiny retina, and then your eyes glow from reflected light, but that's a totally different thing altogether. Uh, no, you don't have beams coming out of your eye, but we're kind of all wired up to think that people do. 
right? And we learn over time to suppress that belief. And one of the more interesting findings was Piaget, the developmental psychologist, who realized that essentially all children start with that belief and they have to be taught otherwise. And so all of us at some point in our um, childhood learned and had that switch over and, and realized, oh, wait, it comes in, it doesn't go out. Just regarding extramission and vision as this force that can interact with reality, talk to us about your experiment with the pillar and the person staring at the pillar. So um, the, the, what our survey, we had a pretty broad-based survey across the United States, and it was about 5% of adults. It was all adults that we studied about 5% believe that vision involves something coming out of the eyes. Some of them believed a combination uh, and um, some of them thought it was just coming out. The, the, none of the PhDs believed in it, which I thought was kind of funny. And that I guess it means there's hope for humanity. I don't know, but um, anyway, <clears throat> um, yes, there were some prior studies that suggested the percentage was much higher and I'm skeptical of those prior studies, and I don't really know what they measured. Those were in the 90s, the 1990s, so it's not that long ago, and people were claiming that as much as 50% of the population believed in extramission. And, I, and it may be how you ask, uh, or it may be that they were being trolled by their, their subjects, I don't know. I have, I have a hard time believing it's that, that large, but the point is really not that a lot of people believe it, intellectually. <clears throat> the point of our research is that whether you believe it intellectually or not, we all have a kind of built-in bias. And the bias is not that we think light comes out of the eyes so that we can see. The bias is that we think of attention, someone else's focused attention, as though it were like an energy beam coming out and touching the thing they're attending to. So the, the one of the experiments we did, one of the first ones, so basically you look at an object, it's a picture of an object on a computer screen, but you're sitting in front of the screen as a subject in our experiment, and you see an object sitting on a table, and the object is tilted a little bit like it might fall over, and your job is to decide, will it fall over or not, essentially. That's your job. Will it fall over or not? And you answer that question. And sometimes it's tilted one way and sometimes the other. Now, what we do is we uh, insert in this picture that you're looking at a, a face staring at the object. And we don't tell you anything about that face. It's just there, just whatever, looking at the object. Uh, and you are more likely to think the object will fall over if there's a face looking at it with the eyes as if there were some kind of beam shooting out and pushing on the object, help, helping to knock it over. And you'll think the object is less likely to fall over if it's falling toward the face and the eye beams are helping to hold up the object. And so, uh, of course, you know, there's nothing coming out of the eyes because it's a picture <laughs> and it's a cartoon and we drew it and it's just on a computer screen. But that's how people interpret it. And the key is everyone does this, whether they know it or not. So in a nutshell, people unconsciously think that what they're staring at, they somehow have an effect on it. Whether they believe this fact or not does not matter. They believe that vision works via intromission and that's fine. But in reality, their internal model is convinced that someone staring at an object does have an effect on it because you make the unconscious inference that this is going to happen. So we inherently look at other people as generators of attention. And we inherently think of attention as like an invisible sauce that can flow out of the eyes and touch things. And in a simplified way, that's how we keep track of the people around us and what they're paying attention to. And uh, so another study we did, which is also, I think sort of helps add to that whole picture. If you um, are part of one of our experiments and if we put you in a scanner, MRI scanner, plop you in there and show you a picture of a face looking at an object, 
like a face looking at a tree, just staring at it. We'll, we will find activity in your visual cortex that represents motion, the same area that normally represents flowing motion. And it will encode the same signals as though something were flowing from the face to the object. So there it is in the brain, the social areas of the brain are talking to the visual areas and telling them, make up this fake signal, very subtle, very so under the surface that it's more like a, a whisper of an impression, not really a clear perception. Because you know, evolution would not give us something that interferes with our actual vision. So it, it, there's a limit to how strong that signal can get. Uh, but there it is. It's, it's, it's baked into us. It's part of our simple, I, I think of it like the, uh, the football commentator who draws the arrows, you know, showing this person's going there and that one's going there. As soon as we walk into a room with other people, that's what our brain's doing drawing little moving arrows saying, oh, he's attending to that. She's attending to the clock on the wall. <laughs> he's attending to the door. We just map it all out uh, instantaneously. Our social brain does this for us and we can't help it. As a medical doctor, I'm often inclined to think about how can we turn these theoretical models into practical tools? Do you think that attention schema theory or trying to understand the brain um, with a more neuroscientific perspective can somehow eventually help others with their internal models or schemas. For example, if you take patients with, with the, on the autistic spectrum, um, there's clearly something going on with their theory of mind and therefore the, the attribution of consciousness to others. Um, at what, what point do you think the research can become practical and we can start manipulating these, these schemas or these models internally? Well, one thing is just recognizing that these things exist, right? Because once you recognize they exist, then you can hone training. And you mentioned autism. Autism is this huge, really interesting, but really diverse uh, set of people, right? And so in some sense, there's no one autism disease, which makes it much harder to study. Uh, but one of the, actually the only intervention in autism that really works at any level that uh, consistently is this intensive intervention, this intensive social training from a very early age. And it seems to me that it would be really useful to know these things, to know what it is specifically, what are the kinds of social constructs and social models uh, that need to be tuned up in a brain. You know, it's, it's you need to understand that other people have minds, but you need to understand that other people have attention and you need the simplifying tricks that everyone else uses, like the simplifying trick of thinking of attention like an invisible energy that flows out of the head toward the thing you're attending to, right? As dumb as that sounds intellectually, that's what we're all doing because it helps us get through the day and helps us understand people in a really uh, quick and immediate way. I know I mentioned panpsychism at some point, and I also mentioned Christoph Koch. Um, I think when you think about some theories of consciousness, for example, Julia Tononi's integrated information theory and Christoph Koch, I mean, they are pioneers of this theory. And Donald Hoffman does a very similar thing when he talks about reality and consciousness. But what these people do that's very different, although very much basing it on science. They're, they are taking a fundamentally neuroscientific or physicalist view of consciousness. But the, the part that they change or differ from you is that they're starting as consciousness being a basic fundamental entity of the universe. And they, for integrated information theory, for example, they use phi to represent consciousness and each being has a certain level of phi. Speaking of phi, I've got phi right there with psi psychology and philosophy. Anyway, I mean, let's talk about that briefly. The most common view of consciousness out there of people who are really far out and people who are trying to be really rational and, and stick to the science, across all of them, the most common view is there's a feeling inside me what causes it. 
there's a subjective feeling. Where does it come from? What causes it? It must, if you're a, a, a sort of a, a rational reductionist, you think, well, the brain must cause it. And if you're more spiritual, you think, no, it gets put into us from some higher power. But let's take the most scientific view, the uh, common scientific view, the brain produces it, the feeling. Where does it come from? What I'm saying is once you frame the question that way, you're lost. There's no answer. You've gone completely in the wrong direction because uh, it's, it's like saying uh, before Newton figured out what white light is, right? People used to look at white light and say, oh, it's um, light that's been scrubbed clean of all contaminants. And now let's ask the question, how does that happen? How does light get cleaned of all contaminants and turn into pure brightness with no colors in it? And the answer is it doesn't, that's not right. What's happened there is the brain, our visual system constructed a super simple model that's not accurate. And that's what we have cognitive access to. And therefore we mistakenly think that bright light, white light is pure brightness with no color but that's not literally what's going on out there, right? So as soon as people say, I have a feeling inside me, a subjective feel, what causes it? Uh, that's the wrong track. And the only logical uh, workable track is to say, my brain has described itself as having a subjective experience. Why does my brain construct that information about itself, right? That's a totally different question and it's a totally answerable question. And you don't need quantum mechanics and you don't need anything spooky. All you need is to deal with uh, information processing mechanisms. A lot of theories of consciousness say essentially, there's a mechanism and then the feeling, the experience feeling comes out and we don't know exactly how or why that gap is bridged, but this is the mechanism that when you run it causes the feeling to emerge. And there, there are tons of theories like that, like information has to circle through this network or it has to go through that loop or it has to get into the global workspace or whatever it is, uh, but they get stuck at that last step. Well, the attention schema theory gets you past that last step. It basically makes the last step dissolve. It says, well, actually you don't need the feeling to emerge. You need an extra piece of information that's telling you that you have a feeling, uh, right? So uh, the, take the attention schema theory and the global workspace theory and stick one on the other. And you start to have a really interesting, rich account of what's going on as the brain focuses its attention and the global workspace theory is a lot about attention. It's basically a theory of attention, of, of the highest level of attention, where uh, the central co cognitive parts of the brain take in the most important chunks of information and process them most deeply and give access to lots of other structures around the brain. And I think a lot of our attempts to understand consciousness and a lot of the misinterpretations and the debates all stem from Rene Descartes. I mean, for all those who are not familiar, we know that Cartesian dualism, named after Rene Descartes, this dualistic view, the fact that we think that our minds and bodies are separate entities, they're not the same. The mind or soul for some people are two different things. I think that's exactly where the problem started. And from there onward, we've been trying to understand this question by always taking into account that there must be some sort of a separation. What Descartes did was looked at his existence, realized that everything isn't real. I mean, during that time, science was changing, fields were all becoming very dynamic, and he started to realize that reality is actually quite non-existent in a sense. But the one thing he was certain of was the fact that he was thinking about the fact that everything else isn't there. So the one thing that must be true then is the fact that his mind exists, cogito ego sum. I mean, that's where that comes from. So there's this history that has changed the way we've perceived this question for such a long time. How has it impacted us? 
Yeah, there's a, you're right. There's a, there's a really interesting long history on that as well, because of course there's lots of views in which you have a soul, but it's not immortal. It dies when you die. And there's views where you have lots of different components and some live and some don't live. Uh, and so there's this huge, you know, for thousands of years, you can go back to Aristotle and so on. Uh, uh, so the, these questions have become glommed together in people's minds, right? People tend to think that having a magic mind, a dualistic idea basically, and having an eternal mind are the same thing and they're not, right? Those are really two separate concepts and one could be, you know, logically true and the other not. But um, uh, so it's actually, so philosophically has had a very interesting complex history. Uh, but I, I would say the heart of the problem is the brain builds simplified models that are not accurate, but are pretty good. And if you take those models to be literally accurate and then try to explain how those properties come about, then you're stuck. Like then you're just stuck trying to explain how white light lost, you know, got scrubbed clean of impurities, right? That's like the, then then you're sunk. <laughs> exactly. So you 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 can't assume that the brain's models are literally accurate. You know, I'm actually curious. Um, I read your previous book, Consciousness and the Social Brain, and thereafter rethinking consciousness, a scientific theory of subjectivity. Um, or subjective experience. But what I'm really fascinated by is what drew you towards this? I know you studied physics as a major before you went into neuroscience. So do you think that that played a role in forming your decision of consciousness being this sort of caricature? Because I once came across a very fascinating book called Mind-Body Problems. I forgot the author's name at this point, but Basically, the author went around looking at each person who studies the human brain and tried to figure out what points in their lives may have guided them towards this conclusion they have regarding consciousness. Uh, it's very personal. It's very strange for someone to do that because it's, it's quite, uh, it's digging into someone's personal life. For example, I think for Christoph Koch, the author looked into the fact that there was something happening with um, his love life and thereafter this search for consciousness inherently stems from this longing for romance or it, it, I'm probably not explaining it correctly, but I think we all have our biases and something always triggers someone to think in a certain way. And we can't escape these heuristics and shortcuts. It's inherent to all of us, myself included. So do you think that your study of physics and your background somehow led you to this materialistic or physicalist view of consciousness? Uh, yes, I started out in physics. I studied physics uh, in, as an undergrad. And, you know, I've kept up a little bit with some of it just because I'm really curious about how the world of physics is going, uh, theoretical physics. Uh, so this is all very fascinating to me. Oddly, though, theoretical physics tends to lend itself to a bit more of a... Um, hmm, a, a non-physical view of consciousness. So I'm sure you've also kept up with quantum consciousness theories too. Physics is really easy to abuse, I've noticed. <laughs> it's it's really easy to take confusing uh, concepts and morph them into, it's almost like, well, nobody understands consciousness and nobody understands quantum physics. So therefore, da -da, they must relate to each other. And there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on, uh, which drives me insane. I can't stand that. But that's that uh, physics. Physics has a strange relationship to consciousness. I think that uh, the solution to consciousness is much simpler uh, and it's rooted in information processing and it's rooted in this kernel the central little bit of logic that rather than trying to understand how magic gets in the brain we should be trying to understand how the brain constructs self-descriptive information simplified enough and not quite accurate enough that it's telling itself that it has magic and that's a totally different thing so 
I went from physics to neuroscience. And I studied all kinds of nuts and bolts issues in neuroscience. Actually, I spent many years studying uh, sensory processing at a very low level and movement control at a very low level uh, and how the brain controls hand to eye coordination and, and how the brain processes the space around the body and so on. So I have all this, you know, 25 or 30 years of work on these other topics. But I think never far from the minds of many people in psychology and neuroscience is this question of subjective experience of consciousness. Like, where does that come from? So you get all these circuits and they compute stuff, but then how is it that I say, oh, I have a subjective experience of what I'm doing? Where does that come from? And so at some point I uh, began to switch over to that. And that switch had to do with, um, I was studying movement control. How does the brain control the arm? And there's a fundamental principle that the brain builds a simulation of the arm, a model of the arm called the arm schema. It's just information in the brain that it uses to keep track of what the arm is and what it's doing and where it is. And we all know about the arm schema. If you get an amputation, uh, um, you know, many people unfortunately lose an arm, uh, they can have a phantom limb. What is that phantom limb? It's pure information in the brain, keeping track of a limb that's no longer there. That's your arm schema minus the arm. But the, the brain can't control movement of the limbs without its model, its nice simplified little cartoonish model of the limbs. And I began to think about, well, how does the brain control its own internal processes? Like attention, how does it move its attention around from thing to thing, just like moving an arm around? Well, it can't do that unless it has a model of its own attention, just like it needs a model of the arm to control the arm. And so this it, uh, concept emerged of the attention schema is the brain's cartoonish kind of magical, uh, caricature of its own attention. I know you call consciousness a caricature and you try to avoid the word illusion because you know there's a lot of backtracking that has to occur once you say that consciousness is an illusion. And a lot of people tend to think that illusionism is some sort of a metaphysical, strange explanation for consciousness, which actually it's not the case. Uh, I'm actually going to chat to Keith Frankish about illusionism very soon. So but I know you try to avoid this, and it's, it's intriguing to me because the truth of the matter is, Michael, your theory of consciousness is very much an illusionist theory of consciousness. I mean, you're basically saying we've, we're building these models, we're explaining our conscious reality by making an, an attribution of a conscious experience. While we are saying that it's false, I know you're not trying to diminish the fact that we have these experiences. It's very clear from your theory that you're not trying to say that while we may draw this conclusion, it doesn't, may, it doesn't mean that the experience doesn't matter because that's something people often misinterpret about both illusionism and attention schema theory. Well, I think it's really difficult to grasp that concept, not because it's a complicated concept, just because it, it flies in the face of everything that we think we know from the time we're born, right? So, uh, one thing that gets in the way, I think a, a lot of people think if you believe in what's, as you call it, illusionism, if you believe that you know, the, the, the brain is, as I put it, building a caricature of itself. So there is no actual in, internal magic. It's the brain describing itself as having magic. A lot of people think if you believe that, then you will lose the magic. Like you won't, you won't have that anymore. It won't, you, you'll look inside yourself and no longer see it, right? And so many people say, well, I, that's ridiculous. I look inside myself and I see it. So nothing's gonna make that stop. Nothing's gonna make that go away, no matter what you try to convince me to believe. And I, I think, that perspective is a mistake uh, because this is one of those cases where 
you can be, you can understand something intellectually, but it will never change the automatic processes in your brain. It will never make that stuff go away, right? It doesn't matter that I may know intellectually uh, that this or that isn't really real or isn't literally real. Uh, it's it's in some sense still true for me as well, right? The most important thing is that by explaining that doesn't mean explaining it away it doesn't make it go away it's there you cannot help it it's you know if i understand like in the old days when i studied movement control if i understand all the bones and muscles in my hand that does not mean that my hands just disappeared like it's still there <laughs> and those mechanisms in the brain are still there i'm not going to make my consciousness go away i'm not going to make my inner certainty that i have it go away and you can though if someone suffers a stroke for example um, they can completely lose their internal model of their arm or their hand. Another great way to talk about that would be um, the rubber hand experiment, where you put your hand on a table next to a rubber hand, and then you, your hand is covered, and then someone else, the experimenter, strokes both hands at the same time. And at some point, you start to believe that the rubber hand is actually your own hand, because then they try and stab the rubber hand, and the people always flinch and move their, their actual arm away which means at that point they've attributed consciousness in a sense to their arm because we always assume our entire being is conscious um so our body schemas are also so fragile that's right so uh yeah the brain when you mess up the brain you mess up those models and of course in the world of consciousness you can mess up uh, areas of the brain and mess up people's consciousness of the world around them and you can produce people who are unfortunately um uh, vegetables. I mean, they're, they're in a, a, a deep coma and have no consciousness capacity left. Uh, and oddly, the among the parts of the brain that you have to lesion for that are these areas deeply involved in social cognition, in understanding the consciousness of others. Uh, so yes, you can mess up these models. And one of the models you can mess up, you were mentioning the, the uh, rubber hand lesion and so on, the models of the arm. Um, yeah, so there are brain lesions that produce this um, syndrome where you uh, no longer recognize your arm as yours, right? So you see it, it's there. Uh, you can even move it to some degree, but it's this weird rubber appendage stuck on your body. It doesn't belong to you. It, you're not, your yourself, your essence doesn't invest it. And uh, what's happened there, it's exactly the opposite of a phantom limb. A phantom limb is no actual arm, but the inner arm, so to speak, the model, the arm schema is still there. Mm -hmm. And this other syndrome, which is caused by damage to the parietal lobe in the, in the cerebral cortex, exactly the opposite, that physical arm is still there, but the model is gone. Uh, and so without that model, I mean, uh, uh, Oliver Sacks has this wonderful description of the, the guy who woke up after a stroke in the hospital and he thought the, um, the medical students had played a prank and put a dead cadaver leg in bed with him. And he was really upset and threw the leg out, but unfortunately it was attached to him and he went with it out of the bed. And uh, he had to get used to this fact that this weird rubbery thing that he had no connection to was part of his body. You know, speaking of Oliver Sacks, this podcast was actually uh, dedicated to Oliver Sacks in a sense. In my introduction episode, I spoke about how one of the first neuroscience books I read was A Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And since then, I've read every Oliver Sacks book. So I consider myself a huge fan of Oliver Sacks and his work. And I think another thing he talks about that's very fascinating is hemispatial neglect. Yes. So yeah, so hemispatial neglect uh, often uh, damaged to the uh, right side of the brain, essentially erasing your awareness of the left side. And particularly interesting to me because the, the epicenter of neglect, the spot that produces the most severe neglect when it's damaged is this social cognition center in the brain, the temporoparietal junction right above the ear uh, and um, this area that is so involved in us understanding and attributing consciousness to others, 
well, you damage that and you have the most severe disruption in consciousness in the clinical literature. So you lose, you, you, you don't lose processing. You can actually process stuff on the neglected side. You know, someone throws a ball at you and you might catch it or duck. Um, and there's, uh, you're just not aware of stuff over there. There's wonderful examples like the, uh, the famous case of the, the patient. They, they would uh, show her pictures of houses and say, okay, do you want to, is this a nice house? Would you want to live there? <clears throat> and, and they were identical houses, but some of them had flames coming out of the left-hand windows and she couldn't consciously process the left side. She wasn't consciously aware of it, but something was processing it because she knew she did not like that house. Yes, and I think there's also a very beautiful Ted Ed video online on YouTube that People can watch, um, and it's one of your videos. I know you're not the one who animates it, but it's based on your work. Uh, I think it's called What is Consciousness by Michael S.A. Graziano. And you see this woman pick the house that is always not on fire, but she doesn't know she's doing this. And I think someone else who does a very fascinating job at describing something very similar is Michael Gazaniga when he talks about his patients with split brains. Yes, 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 that's right. So one of the things he points out is this amazing capacity for people to uh, do what he calls confabulation. So our brains do all kinds of crazy things for reasons that we consciously don't know about. So it's all under the surface. And then it happens and we do it and we notice ourselves doing it and we very confidently make up a reason for it. And we spin a narrative. Uh, that's what the confabulation is. And we spin a narrative about why we did it and, and what we're doing and what our purpose is and what our thinking is and so on. Uh, but uh, at least some of that, some of that narrative is correct. We actually do things for specific reasons, of course, but some of it is made up after the fact. We're always trying to create a nice smooth narrative that makes sense of our, of our lives and the things that we're doing. And you see this a lot with psychiatric patients or neurological patients. A lot of the time they do certain things. When you ask them about that, they always have some sort of a story prepared, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with what actually happened in the moment. And I think with Gazaniga's patients, what's very fascinating is once both hemispheres are split and when they do a corpus cholecectomy, usually for patients with epilepsy, so they split the brain, they cut the corpus callosum. And what tends to happen is these people then almost have two consciousnesses, consciousnesses, that's a strange word to even say, because your left brain, so, so your right hemisphere will do something like, for example, pick up a, an object, and then your left brain will disagree with that and hit the object out of your hand. So it's fascinating because then you have both these hemispheres competing and having a conversation in a sense, but now because the corpus callosum is cut, there's a lack of connectivity and a lack of com communication between both hemispheres. So it begs the question, do we attribute consciousness now in this patient? Do we give them two or, or are there more? Right, right, right. I love that because the concept of the unitary consciousness is part of the cartoon. It's part of the brain simplified cartoon of itself. <clears throat> and, you know, that's not really true. Of course, we're, uh, what is it, 86 billion neurons in the human brain, roughly, uh, in, in, constantly changing alliances and networks. It's, it's a very large heterogeneous batch of stuff going on up in there, but the brain generates a simple idea of itself that there's a central single kind of glowy thing inside that's doing everything. And that's, oh, we can sort of, from the scientific point of view, we can make fun of it a little bit for the simplicity of it, but it's really important. It's unbelievably crucial as part of what my work tries to emphasize. The brain needs models and it needs simple models, basic, simple, straightforward models that it can glom onto that help it understand and keep track and control itself and the things around it. And so it's not that the brain evolved to be stupid and foolish. Uh, the brain evolved to be incredibly efficient and capable because it has these super simple models of what it is and what the things around it are. And I think these explanations, these confabulations and stories and internal models and explanations for everything we're doing 
is very helpful from an evolutionary perspective. It conserves so much energy. You can conserve so much energy doing this, these heuristics, these shortcuts. Uh, it's a great way for you to then spend that energy trying to escape from a lion or from a sensory stimulus that is concerning and is necessary for you to focus your attention on. And so it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective to fake it until you make it when it comes to consciousness. I mean, we don't have to spend so much energy trying to create an essence because evolution does not work that way. Right. So essentially that non-physical substance, as we think of it, I mean, that's the stuff pouring out of the eyes, right? That's the, um, the mystical sauce in the head. It's a convenient fiction that allows the brain to keep track of what it's doing and what its capabilities are. Right. So I sometimes refer to the, the beams that pour out of the eyes as substance C. It's made out of substance C, C being the consciousness stuff, right? That's the, the, the magic stuff that we attribute to each other and to ourselves because it's an easy way to keep track of what brains do. It's a cartoon. I mean, it, uh, you can, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a simple but incredibly effective and necessary way to understand your world and yourself and the people around you just well enough that you can get along, but not so well that you waste time and resources trying to get unnecessary details. It's a really complicated machine. It builds information about itself and we are captive to that information. And so we say with great conviction, all kinds of things about ourselves that aren't literally true. And if you assume they're literally true, then you can't, you, you're sunk. There's no scientific way to explain those things that, that the brain created, uh, right? So it's, uh, the question is, how does the brain build these descriptions of itself that are pretty good, but not fully accurate? And that's something, essentially what I'm saying is the, 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 the mystery is solved. Right? There is no mystery. It's, it's, it's fundamentally solved. There are details yet to fill in, but there's a lot that actually is already known. Uh, but the controversy comes about because so many people cannot get themselves out of that idea. No, there really is a subjective, feely thing inside me. What makes it happen? Since it's computable, since it's all information and it's all taking place in the brain, and if we, if we can understand this information, then of course we can then implement and use this information to either create other minds or upload a mind. So let's, let's try and move step by step trying to explain how would you use that information to try and make an, an artificial intelligence conscious? Right. Yes, that's always fun to speculate about. Uh, and, and uh, I find that particularly fascinating. Yes, the, the implication of all of this is it's information, it's information processing. We may not know all the details. We definitely don't know all the details. The brain is processing in ways that we probably don't understand yet, but it's all information processing. And therefore in principle, it's all uh, migratable to other platforms. And uh, there's, no reason not to, first of all, build machines that think they are conscious in the same ways that we think we are conscious. There's uh, nothing to stop that from happening, I presume, very soon, uh, because artificial intelligence is galloping forward at an incredible rate. Um, so there's that. Then there's the second question, can you take a person's mind already present in the brain and the structure of the brain and essentially recreate it or uh, scan it, copy it into an artificial device. And there, you know, I've, I've thought through that. And it seems to me in principle, yes, there's nothing that stands in the way of that. In practice, the hurdles are unbelievably vast right now. Technological hurdles are huge right now. And so I don't know how many hundred, 200 years maybe more, I don't know, that would take for the technology to be invented. But I'm, I, if we don't blow ourselves up as a species, I think we will get there. There's no way we don't. But what's interesting to me is that we, we know that we are 
embodied beings. There's also this whole field now of for e-cognition, where we look at the fact that we're embodied beings, but we're also embedded in an environment that we have to continuously enact upon. And we've also extended our cognition with the technological tools, like for example, a cell phone or any other object that augments our cognition and human experience. So how do you think that will play a role when you're trying to make an artificial intelligence have similar types of conscious experiences as us? First of all, you can simulate the body and you can simulate the movements and the muscles and the nerves and all the feedback and the physics of an environment. And a lot of people will look at that and say, oh my God, how can you do that? That's ridiculously complex. And the truth is that is already solved. Like that's done. People do that all the time. You just play a really high quality video game and what you have is simulated objects in a physics engine, as they call it, simulated physics world. Uh, in my own lab, ages ago, 20 years ago, we simulated a human arm with all the muscles, every single muscle and nerve and bone and tendon. Uh, and so this kind of thing is, is doable. I mean, it takes some work, but it's the technology is there. So if you want a, an embodied mind, artificial mind, build an artificial embodiment. And that's actually not that hard. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's the answer. If you, if you scan someone's brain in some distant future where that might or might not be possible, I think it will be. And you create a kind of an artificial computer environment uh, for that person to live in, you got to give him a body <laughs> because that's what his mind is used to. So sure, embody it. Um, but I don't see that as anything like a, a, an obstacle. I think a really scary part there is when you look at some people and the way they experience virtual reality and you put them in the, in the virtual reality headset and you get them to do that traditional experiment where they go up an elevator and then they, they're asked to take that final step where you fall off the building and you have to fall to your death. And a lot of people, although they know they're in a room with their feet firmly on the ground, they still struggle to take that initial step because our biology is so ingrained in this reality. And it's so difficult for us to ever be part of another reality that we did not evolve in and for. So I think that complicates things a bit, especially from a medical perspective, because I would think you would cause a lot of psychoses like this. Um, taking a person and, and, and taking them out of touch with reality is exactly what psychosis is, when someone's out of touch with reality. So there, there could be a danger trying to either upload minds or even just putting people into virtual reality headsets for long enough. It could be. I mean, that I think, well, I've often said, don't be an early adopter because it won't go well. <laughs> A lot of wrinkles have to get smoothed out first, but uh, it depends on how it, the problems you're talking about depend on just how faithful the reconstruction is. Mm. So if you can create an avatar body that's really faithful to the original person and their control over it is uh, faithful to the way they had control over their original body, then, you know, a lot of these um, low level uh, difficulties disappear and, and don't have them walk off cliffs. That would be bad for their, their mentality. The, the, the possibilities are bizarre and um, there's ethical nightmares that crop up. I mean, what a mess, but it'll be a very interesting time. That, that I'm sure of. Okay. Okay. Look, I, I, for the most part agree. I think there are certain areas where I believe that trying to create something similar to us will be completely impossible. It takes billions of years of evolution. However, I do think that what we have is not subs is not some sort of an, an essence. It's not metaphysical. Um, we are sort of drawing these conclusions to our existence. And therefore, I do believe it is possible to make other forms of consciousness. Um, and for people who are listening, they obviously can't see, but I'm, I'm using inverted commas when I say consciousness, because I'm not sure if you're familiar with Westworld, but it's very fascinating to see how it's so difficult for human beings to not attribute consciousness to a robot or an artificial intelligence that looks like us, acts like us, 
talks like us. So when David Chalmers, and I think it, I think it was 1996 or 1995, spoke about philosophical zombies, inherently, you can't really talk about a philosophical zombie because there's no way for me to ever say that you are not conscious because you're doing everything I do. You're talking to me right now. You seem to be engaging with me with some sort of cognition. You're replying to everything I'm saying. Alan Turing, if you do the Turing test, you're probably going to pass. And every species of robot in Westworld does this. So at some point, there's this blurry line between who is human and who is not. Doing That's right. So not only uh, is it almost impossible for you to conceive of me as a non-conscious being during this conversation, but you're essentially doing the same thing to yourself, right? You're attributing consciousness to yourself. You have more continuous data on yourself. And so it's an even more potent, um, uh, you know, process with respect to yourself. But yeah, so we do that with the, ourselves. We do that with each other. Uh, we're all philosophical zombies. And Chalmers has this really interesting perspective that he has written about more recently that he calls the meta problem. Mm -hmm. So there's the, the hard problem. Uh, what is the magic mystical stuff essentially that is hard to grasp scientifically. And then there's the meta problem. Why do we think we have a hard problem? <laughs> Why would we even think that? Like what put that in our heads? What is the mechanism that leads people to be so darn certain we have a hard problem? I find it, I find it absolutely hilarious that the guy who comes up with the hard problem of consciousness years later decides to come up with the meta problem of consciousness. It's to me, it's just, it's, it's, it's just really funny. I <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and the attention schema theory answers the meta problem. In psychiatry, we have a similar version of the philosophical zombie, but in a, in a sense, this would rather be a psychological zombie, a, a patient with schizophrenia and highly sedated. So on really high dose antipsychotics, completely sedated, the person looks, acts and walks like a zombie. And again, for all those listening, I'm using inverted commas, uh, inverted commas. And patients with negative symptoms of schizophrenia also have a very similar experience. They're apathetic, anhedonic ambivalent. They're sort of just walking around, not taking care of themselves. They don't look as quote unquote conscious as the rest of us. And that becomes tricky for me because I find that fascinating because not only then are we attributing consciousness to everything around us and ourselves, but we also have this innate ability to attribute less consciousness to some people. We have this ability to look at someone else and, and give them less consciousness than us. And, and, and that's concerning because when you look at the philosophical zombie argument, it then breaks down even more at this point, because when you take into account the psychological zombie in this case, there's no way to really tell the difference between this person who has schizophrenia and all these negative symptoms of the psychosis and us. And yet this person is conscious this person is having normal human experiences. There's nothing zombie about them. They're just normal human beings who seem different from us. That's quite a risk. Uh, I mean, if we evolved this incredibly powerful tendency to attribute awareness and consciousness to others as a social mechanism to make us a cooperative species, now uh, there's this risk that we can dehumanize each other and fail to see a conscious mind in each other. And, um, and you know, that's, um, I mean, to put it really bluntly, and I, I apologize for the sort of sudden turn toward the serious, but uh, for one person, you know, someone like George Floyd struggling and screaming for help is just a, an object without any experience in it. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, that guy's knee is on his neck. That guy doesn't see a conscious experience there. It's just a thing. And then to bystanders looking at it, it's so clear that there's a conscious subjective experience that's really intense 
in that in that person in that human being and so you get these huge differences in how people are able to attribute uh conscious experience mm -hmm. and that makes it that's the heart of social uh, of our social um cooperation or social well-being i mean and they also do this as an experiment where they put you up on a functional mri and they start showing you a series of pictures and each image is of someone so for example perhaps a ceo of a company a doctor, a teacher, etc. But some of those pictures are pictures of street dwellers, people who live on the streets, or a beggar on the side of the street. And what they noticed is that your brain regions that light up generally for normal social interactions tend to light up less when you're looking at a picture of a street dweller or a beggar, which means at some point unconsciously, normal, kind-hearted human beings who think they are altruistic believe they are saints, to some unconscious level, they are attributing less consciousness or less humanity to someone, and they just don't know that they're doing this. That's right. You, you, you can see people as having more or less vividness of, of experience, of conscious experience. So you look at the street beggar and you figure out, I mean, at some unconscious level, you figure out that person doesn't feel as much that person isn't as aware it doesn't have as much subjective oomph. Uh, and that's you know i think uh, uh, consciousness the ability to see it in each other is a, a tool that evolution gave us to be a pro-social species so do you think the fact that i mean with covid and the fact that we're always in front of screens we're no longer engaging socially in the real world do you think this is going to affect us because we are fundamentally a social species and everything's changing? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's certainly causing it, uh, seismic changes in us uh, at many, many levels um, that many people haven't fully appreciated yet. Uh, I mean, the, the, the whole online way of interacting is quite incredible. I, uh, a lot of human social interaction is structured around the physical spaces between people. Um, I mean, we have this whole uh, kind of social dance with respect to each other that helps shape and regulate social interaction. And then it all goes away yeah. online and it changes people in really strange ways, some good, some bad. Michael, just briefly tell us about some of the research you guys are currently up to. So one thing we do, of course, is continue lots of brain imaging because we're interested in where in the human brain these things take place. Um, and part of that interest is because that leads to uh, an ability to look at clinical cases where you get stroke damage to this or that part of the brain. That's one area of research. Um, but another that is, uh, we're beginning to get more into at this point is the um, computational, the uh, artificial intelligence side. And so we've really been trying to Build this stuff, even if it's at a very simple level, just trying to go one little step at a time, because if you can build it, you understand it. If you can build attention, you understand attention. If you can build an attention schema, then you understand what that is as well. And so that's been uh, a large push uh, on, on our part. So let's say you're trying to construct something that will attribute consciousness to itself and something that we will attribute consciousness to. So the Turing test will pass. Uh, what are the steps to make that happen? Sure. Well, we're working on it. Mm -hmm. We're working uh, very hard. And um, first, a machine that requires and uses attention. And so vision is the most obvious place to start. A machine that has a camera that sees the world and then must focus its attention and not just point its eyeball here and there, but receive vast amounts of information, sort it and have some way of limiting itself to one part of what it sees, right? And uh, so that's number one, attention. It needs attention and this is not that hard to build and uh, uh, many, many people have built attention machines. Number two, a way of a mechanism for controlling its own attention. 
uh, for directing its own attention. Move here, move there. Number three, a really good, rich, useful model of its own attention. So that in effect, it knows I have attention. It's here right now. Um, I want it to go there. If it goes there, then I'll be able to know what's going on there and react to it, right? So those are the most fundamental components that you need to begin with is attention uh, and uh, control of attention and some kind of model, what's often called an engineering and in internal model, an internal model of attention. Uh, give it those and you have the very beginning the very simple beginnings. We're not talking something like C-3PO that can talk about what's going on in there, right? That's a separate thing to give it the ability to report verbally on its own internal processes. That, that's also very interesting to work on. Uh, but the, the core, the essence of it uh, are these very simple components. From your side, what do you really think um, someone could tell you or a convincing counter argument to the attention schema theory. Do you think that you've hit the nail right on the head with this one? Is there anything anyone can say to you that will make you think otherwise regarding the way you perceive consciousness at this point? Oh, convincing counter arguments. There are none. So there's, uh, there's essentially two views of consciousness. Uh, the, most common one until now is fundamentally a magicalist view. There's some magic essence and we have to explain how it emerges. And then there's the other view, which is there's no magic essence. This is a, a, all about information processing and the, and the brain. Uh, the, the question is, how does the brain self-describe in this particular way? Um, and to me, there's no comparison. I mean, uh, there's one, one is pseudoscience. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry to call so much work out there pseudoscience, but it is, it's magic. It's uh, not actual science. And then there's the science and the attention schema theory fits into that science. And I think there's a, there's a lot of people who would argue over this and that detail and should we say that and should we do it this way? And sure, why not? Uh, you know, I'm sure I uh, said lots of things in my academic papers on the topic that will turn out not to be correct. But the framework, the general framework is um, not only, I'm certain, correct, but kind of has to be logically. It's just, a, it's a choice between magic versus science. Mm. Well, on that note, Michael, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. It was a pleasure to chat to you once again. I know it's been almost a year since we last spoke. I urge everyone and anyone to read Rethinking Consciousness. It is an excellent book. As I said, I've read this book three times. I think each time you read it, you learn something new. So please pick up your own copy. Thank you. I, I, I'm very happy you enjoy the book and the work so much. And Michael, thank you for joining me. I'm sure that because of you and because of this episode, we've taken at least one step closer to the mind-body solution. <music>